Okay, I'm Lakshmi Prathuri, and I'm the host and curator of the Inc. Conference. And I collect people and connect them. That's what I do. And, uh, you know, as a background, I've been in, at Intel for many years, venture capitalist, nonprofit. And now I run uh, my own conference called the Inc. Conference. So since we are doing this uh, interview for We Magazine, especially for We India, my yes. very first question would be, what is your understanding of we, and how has this understanding of we changed since the rise of the internet, where networking not only became real, but also virtual? Um, you know, in a strange way, my coming back to India uh, has started with the whole possibility of networking. You know, I've been away since 1983. And in 2001, I started coming back because I really saw a great potential of how we can educate the next generation because of the possibility of the internet. It's not about teaching someone just how to program or how to do one thing, but if you can program them to learn and give them access to the tools, the kind of education that comes is absolutely amazing. So, uh, and India in general, you know, as a culture, it's a very connected culture, you know. Um, we are, you know, we have cousins and second cousins and third cousins and grandparents and, and they're all close. So it's not like this is my immediate family and then there's this family surrounding, but they're all equally close. So we each are a node, you know, we are not each an isolated point. We each are connected to, you know, or we are a bay, you know, where a lot of things are plugged into us. So as a culture, we are very connected. So if you can truly teach people the possibility of connectedness through networking, I think this will become the greatest source of education as well as re recipient of education in the true sense of the word. So how would you define the we for yourself? What, is, what does we mean for you? You know, I have been raised by a whole group of people. You know, my experience of being in India you know, my father was my primary parent, but my grandparents lived with us, my sisters, and my sister's husband's mother, who always remembered my favorite dishes and made it for me. So to me, I'm used to life being, um, I'm used to life containing many, many people who contribute different things to you. My sense of, uh, you know, how generous somebody could be comes from my sister's mother-in-law who had nine children and, but me, his, her daughter-in-law's sister, when I went to her village, she would remember my favorite dishes and make them for me, all quietly, without ever complaining. Similarly, every value I have, it's come from a different person, not just from one parent. So, uh, to me, moving back to India now, you know, that's the greatest thing that I can offer my child, I'm a nine-year-old boy, is that it's never I. I am not raising my child. It's we, you know, it's the help we have at home, the people who drive us, the neighbors that we have who take care of my son if I'm late, or, you know, his home teacher who lives with us, who takes care of his homework, or my husband, his sister, my sister, who keep coming and going. I mean, it is amazing to have a different cast of characters be involved in doing anything you want to do. So the thing you have to get used to in India is that you can't just do whatever you want, you know, forgetting everybody else. You have to always take in uh, others' inputs and make adjustments along the way. Uh, otherwise, you would just do one little thing that will affect only you. But if you really want to create an impact in India, you have to take into consideration multiple points of view and allow many people to participate, which means you have to give up control a lot to make an impact here. So you already said a couple of things, but actually <coughs> India makes India, so the network kind of thing. I always used to say, you know, for me, India is like the internet. Correct. So what other characteristics or what would you say makes really India, India? You know, all the things that actually drive you crazy when you first come to India are the things that are the strength of India. And I'll just mention, you know, three of them, and there's like 20 of them. The first thing is that, you know, it's so chaotic, you know, just, it, it is 
the definition of chaos comes from India, you know, be it traffic or be it predictability of a meeting or be it, uh, um, you, you know, uh, the background of a person, no matter what it is, everything is chaotic. It's not a very clean process by which things come to you. But what I've learned is that when you have a billion people with different capabilities, different uh, economic uh, backgrounds, etc., you cannot have one system that fits all. So the chaos that you see is not really a chaos. It's different systems that are there for different sets of people. And once you figure out, like you're doing chaos theory, you start seeing the patterns in the chaos. But if you don't understand that there is really 50 patterns to solve one problem, you would get very frustrated. So the first thing is, what seems chaotic actually has an order to it if you understand the patterns of the different levels of people that are involved. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, you know, all my upbringing in America was about this is work and this is home. You know, you don't mix the two. You're supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, you're there at 8 o'clock. You finish at 7 or 8 or 9 or whatever it is. And um, it's very, very clear. Whereas, you know, when I first started my company in India, you know, what drove me nuts is that people suddenly won't come at 9 o'clock because whatever, you know, there's a reason. But actually, if you sit and understand, you know, the traffic is very unpredictable. All it takes is one accident in the middle of the road. You could be delayed by two hours. So, and people, everybody doesn't have cars, so you have to depend on public transportation. And people come from two hours away, three hours away. So really, you have to bake, it, bake in the variables that are here on making things count on time. It's one thing to afford a car where the driver shows up an hour ahead of time and then you make it. And it's another thing when people have to put in so much work to get to a place. And the other thing is that there is no separation of work and emotion. You know, So I gave this example before, like one of my colleagues was late one day and I asked her why and she said, oh, you know, my neighbor, he fell down, I had to take him to the hospital or whatever. I said, you must have had other neighbors who don't work who are at home. Why didn't you ask them to take care of him? And she looked at me with like a blank expression. She said, it didn't even occur to me. I mean, to her, it was not about, I have to get to work, so how can I get somebody else to help this? To her, it was in her DNA when my neighbor falls down my first priority is I have to take him to the hospital, you know. Now, if there was something urgent at work, like she had to be at an event at a certain time, her priorities would have changed. If that did, that wasn't there, it was okay to mix the personal time with the work time. But what that also opened me to is that I think we can't forget our civic duty as a human being because we somehow have to get to work at time without questioning uh, do I really need to be there at that time? So you really end up mixing home and work a lot because the same employee, she goes and from 7 to 11, she is on the computer working. She gets up at 6 in the morning, from 6 to 9, she is there. So you have to allow that flexibility a lot. So, and you know, you have to allow work time and personal time to mix. You know, that's the second thing. And the third thing is about children, which I absolutely love here. You know, one of the things that drove me nuts in the U.S. was this play dates, you know, in terms of for my child to play with somebody of his own age, I have to call the mother of the other child and make an appointment. So on Saturday, between 12 and 1, they can play an hour before we rush them off to all the other classes. We have to drive them around. But here, I feel there is a certain freedom for the child to go play in the neighbor's house and for them to come over. You know, the doors are always open. And, uh, um, and, and so I really feel that what seems as lack of privacy in some ways, because anybody can show up anytime into your home, also is really great because it gives your child a space to be free instead of everything being timetabled. So, I mean, these are just three things that mm -hmm. come to the top of my head, I can tell you, that used to drive me nuts, but now I see actually the wisdom in them, and I'm okay with it.
So what made you actually come back to India? Uh, you know, I hosted, uh, co-hosted TED India with Chris Anderson. So the idea was we were going to come host it and go back. But when I started coming here and uh, started hearing the stories, I was like, wow, you know, there's so much of India that needs to be uh, communicated through stories. Uh, because I feel that living outside India for about 25 plus years, I can tell with personal experience that the idea of India is never communicated in its entirety. It's, uh, you know, I say, uh, it's sort of like the blind man and the elephant story, you know. Depending on what aspect of the elephant the blind man touches, he says that's how the elephant looks like. It's round and stout, it's long and wavy, it's thin and long. And, you know, but no one has a full picture because they haven't seen it. So I feel, you know, India is like that. You know, most of the people see only one aspect of it. But I really wanted to create a platform where we can showcase all different aspects of India uh, through stories because storytelling is our heritage. You know, our Upanishads were written based on that. Our, uh, you know, mythology is based on that. You know, our learning in our early age was based on storytelling. And we've somehow completely haven't lost it, but we are losing it. So I feel it's time we grab it and get back to storytelling and tell our stories so the rest of the world can know what's happening here and also bring the best stories from the rest of the world into India because we have a lot to learn. So saying this on one hand and then looking at in talks, which I really enjoyed last year, I was there for the very first time. What are your thoughts? How can you scale this? I mean, the conference <coughs> itself, it's a very elitist thing. And I don't say it's bad. Or it's, it's a kind of, it, you know, it yeah. is. So, but how can we scale this knowledge into areas, you know, where people have struggled to survive? How can we manage You know, that? this is another concept I've really changed in my mind after coming to India, it, very ironically, is that scale is not everything, you know. The key is leverage, you know. Can I find... 300 people who really matter and influence them because they can do much more with their resources than I can on my own. It's very unrealistic in my mind even to think that I can affect a billion people directly. So one leverage point is the 300 people who we invite and uh, we do, you know, people have to apply to uh, attend, we are being elitist about who we invite because we want them not just to have money but have the capacity to impact the world. So one is through leverage of people. The second is you create platforms, you know, like Intalks.com or we have some other ideas we are pursuing. You create platforms where people can come there and access information in an easy way so that they can take it and make it whatever they want. So if people watch these stories and are inspired by it, what they do with it is up to them. I mean, the Indian government is talking about every panchayat having fiber to the curb by, you know, in 18 months or two years, even if that happens in five years, let's assume. When broadband comes to every household in about five years, if we are there with really amazing content that can inspire people, I think we would have done our job. So I feel that the way you achieve scale is not by trying to reach everybody, but by creating platforms and groups of people that can take it to many people in an easy way. Yeah. So today we are in Delhi. I haven't been to Bangalore, but I assume it's the same thing. I mean, this city is somehow full of tension. Yeah. If you watch it, yeah. it's very yeah. chaotic, as you said. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you see everything. There is the past, it's the present, which can be pretty evil, but also, you know, you find anything scaling up to the sky. And then yeah. you also see future if you go, especially down to the south to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, is this one of the secrets? Uh, of India that, you know, living with these tensions and living with all these mm -hmm. unequality, that 
you know, it's a very innovative uh, place as well. I think there are two things about India is that every possible disease, every possible negative thing in the world, every possible problem in the world, and every possible opportunity in the world, and every possible positive point exist here, all at the same time. So, you know, so if you can make something work here, you can make it work anywhere. So India is very unforgiving in what it accepts. So it's sort of, you can't escape anything here. You know, birth, death, you know, good, bad, they're all in your face. So it's not like, okay, there is this one neighborhood in the town where all the poor people live. If you never go there, you'll never get to see it. It's not like that. Even if you live in the most posh place, you see abject poverty. So you cannot escape the realities of life when you're in India. It's very uncomfortable for a lot of people, but that's just the way it is. So it is very unforgiving in that. It's not putting any false layers and shoving things under the carpet. You know, the whole floor is bare. So I think that is, in fact, the strength of India is that you can't escape it. So you're forced to deal with it in a way that it is acceptable to everyone. So you have a great place where you can experiment everything. And at the same time, it forces you to be honest with yourself because you just cannot escape yourself when you're here. Mm -hmm. you know? I think it was uh, Ruth Prower, Ruth Prower Jawala in one of her books, she talks about this, is that how in India you can't escape from yourself. You know, okay. and, and I know I've lived in California for a long time. You know, you go to Stanford, you go to University Avenue, everything is great. You cross the bridge and you go to East Palo Alto where the crime rate was the highest and, you know, every house has a shutter, etc. And you wouldn't even know it existed half a mile away because there's it's such separate, separate worlds. Yeah. Where in India, it's not like that. It's all intermingled. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the discomfort would be higher, but, you know, this is the truth. You can't hide it. Yeah. So what do you think, like, I mean, India has been growing like China the last 15, 20 years like crazy. Mm -hmm. There is something like a real middle class now. People say it's about 300 million people. But there is still 1 billion and becoming more and more and more every day somehow seem to be left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, how can a huge country like <coughs> India, mm -hmm. uh, where they don't seem to take very much care about what's happening here in Delhi, if you are in Madhya Pradesh, where we are based, how can you deal, you know, with this great differences? Do you have any idea or any advice how it could work? Uh, you know, for me, this whole thing of um, someone needs to take care of it is going to go away soon. And I think that will happen because of two reasons in India. The first reason is the post-1991 generation. You know, people who are born when the country has been on its upswing, when there is economic um, uh, upturn. The way they think of what they can do is very different than what the previous generation thought. This is a truly free generation. So they're not looking for someone else to solve the problem, but they are doing things, a little bit at a time, but they are each doing things. So I think it's just the post-91 generation of 500 million or something that are each trying to figure out how they solve the things. That's the one thing that is, that to me gives me a lot of hope. And the second thing is, once the broadband comes available to everybody, it may come 3G, 4G on phone or, you know, whatever, but once the ability to get online, the ability to see the world comes to everyone, they are going to figure out what to do. Because India is a very entrepreneurial country. And it is a country where individual ownership is taken with pride. So just as there's a middle class, I think there's going to be a middle class and lower middle class companies that are going to come that will take care of me and 10. You know, me and 10 other people in my neighborhood. That's what I will do. And people are going to come up with a lot of these things. So I'm very hopeful for India, you know, 50 years from now, because when the people who are born after 90s really are the ones running things, 
uh, I think there's going to be a huge shift here. But the key is, the, you know, I can't emphasize this enough, is that the current parents shouldn't impose on the children the rules that were imposed on them. It is a scary ride because half the time I don't understand how my child is learning because he's not learning the way I have learned. But I have to give him the benefit of doubt and saying, as long as I teach him the right values at home, you know, not to harm somebody, not to take drugs, you know, the basic stuff, that's all I can teach. The rest, I have to let him learn the way he wants. So it is a bit of a scary ride for the current generation, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important for people who are in their 40s and 50s not to impose their rules on their children. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thank you very much.